Good morning. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers right now on Morning News Now looking for answers. Day six of search and rescue efforts in South Florida brings the death toll from that collapsed condo building to 11 with 150 still unaccounted for. The new questions and murky answers this morning surrounding the high rises structural integrity. Retaliation one day after the U.S. carried out a series of airstrikes on Iran-backed militia groups in the Middle East, American forces came under rocket fire in Syria. We'll bring you the latest from the embattled region. Summer of scorch as a record-breaking heat wave thankfully departs the Pacific Northwest this morning. Northeasterners from Philly to Maine are now cranking up the AC, fending off brutal temperatures of their own. We've got your full forecast on when things could cool off. And Uber expensive rideshare apps like Uber and Lyft are in the midst of a post-COVID renaissance as cooped up Americans begin to travel once again. But a controversial surge in prices has many crying foul behind the hike and how drivers aren't benefiting. We begin with the desperate search through the mountains of rubble in Surfside, Florida. Newly obtained dispatches from first responders offer a new look at what happened in the aftermath of the collapse. 76, I see many people on the balconies. There's, the building is gone. There's no elevators. There's, this is nothing. I mean, it, it almost resembles a trade center. Copy, no elevators. 131 to Some people are evacuating, saying they sound like they heard a bomb. Dozens of families gathered for a candlelight vigil last night as the search for any possible survivors now enters its sixth day. NBC News correspondent Antonia Hilton joins us now from Surfside, Florida. So, Antonia, at this point, it is still a search and rescue mission. Thank you. How hopeful are county officials and rescue teams that they can still find any survivors? Good morning, Joe. You know, there is some tension here in Surfside right now between the words coming from officials and leaders who are maintaining hope that survivors might be found, who want people to keep praying and staying focused on the recovery and rescue efforts, and then with the families, many of whom are kind of coming to terms with the reality that we are on day six, that 11 people have been confirmed dead, but 150 people are still unaccounted for. And so for many of them, that means that they are you know, facing a reality that their loved ones may not have survived that many days under the rubble. In fact, I actually met a woman who lives about a block away from the site of the collapse, and she had a friend who lived in that South Tower that came down, and she told me she has basically just given up hope that her friend is still alive and has had to kind of move forward right now. And, you know, tensions have kind of spilled over. And at times, family members and loved ones have even yelled at officials in private meetings, demanding accountability, trying to understand what the pace is of this recovery. And it has been excruciating for everyone involved. I want you to take a listen to what the mayor of Miami-Dade said last night. We have uh, people waiting and waiting and waiting for news. That is excruciating. Uh, we have them coping with the news that they might not have their loved ones come out alive and still hope against hope that they will. They're learning that some of their loved ones will come out as, as body parts. I mean, this is, this is the kind of, of information that is just excruciating uh, for everyone. So officials are looking at a situation right now where they are trying to respond to the demands and the emotional needs of these families, but they are also supporting rescuers and first responders who are on an extremely dangerous rubble site that requires them to move slowly and meticulously through this process. And those two things do not go well hand in hand. There is pressure to have answers and closure, but there's also a need to be incredibly safe, Joe. Antonio, we now know that a third lawsuit has been filed by victims' families. What is this suit alleging? 
That's right. There is this new third lawsuit, and this is a class action lawsuit that is somewhat similar to the other lawsuits that have been filed and that it points directly at the condo association of the South Tower as responsible, as potentially knowledgeable about the extensive damage that may have been throughout the building in areas like the parking garage, the basement, the pool deck. And it also says that they are going to call for further investigation into other entities or people who could have had knowledge about this at various points over the last few years and try to work to hold them accountable. Uh, the lawsuit really is focused around this plaintiff, Reza Rodriguez, who describes a horrific scene that night of the collapse in which she sort of awoke to the feeling of the building swaying like a piece of paper. She called friends and family in utter horror, saw the collapse out the window, and then tried to escape and sort of wanders through the building, ultimately finding a staircase that is separated from the walls of the building. And so you're just brought into the scene of the horror that night. And, and what she describes is utterly traumatic, but ultimately she is one of the lucky people who was rescued and has survived this collapse. And this is a class action suit, though, that is calling to hold this condo association accountable for the losses and the experience of those like Miss Rodriguez, but also, of course, all of the lives that we're ultimately going to find out have been lost. Joe. All right. Antonia Hilton reporting from Florida. Antonia, thanks so much. With the Delta variant well on its way to becoming dominant here in the U.S., doctors are learning how long some vaccines may provide protection against the virus. NBC News Now correspondent Priscilla Thompson joins us now in the studio with more on the encouraging news. So Priscilla, scientists looked at the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. What all did they find about it? Yeah, well, scientists are saying that Pfizer and Moderna offer an immune response uh, that is uh, set off a persistent immune reaction in the body, uh, excuse me, and that could protect from COVID-19 for years, plural. Uh, take wow. a listen to what si one scientist had to say about it. When you get two doses of the RNA vaccine, and that's in our study, we studied the Pfizer vaccine, this actually means that you have a, a big chance of having a, an immune response that could last for years. Now, that study did not include the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, but researchers say that it may not have as long-lasting impacts as what we're seeing in Pfizer and Moderna. So researchers have also, though we know, been looking into mixing some of the vaccines, and we're now getting an idea of what that might look like. What does that mean? Yeah. So European countries, as a reminder, uh, at one point were giving AstraZeneca as the first dose, but then offering alternatives for that second shot. And that was after AstraZeneca was linked to rare blood clots. And so this study essentially replicated that. So participants received a first dose of AstraZeneca and Pfizer as the second dose. And what they found is that combination produced better immune responses than giving a second dose of AstraZeneca. Now, Researchers called the news encouraging, but also added that same shot regimens should remain the mm. default unless there's a good reason to mm. mix and match. And Priscilla, while we have you, we know summer camps are open once again, some for the first time in more than a year. But in Illinois, health officials are reporting one camp more than 80 cases. Most of them are teenagers. What more can you tell us about this outbreak? Yeah, so this was a summer camp that occurred in mid-June, and what we know is that the camp was not checking vaccination status, nor did they require masks indoors. And this comes, of course, mm -hmm. as the Delta variant is becoming the dominant strain in the U.S. Take a listen to what the governor had to say about that. Already the Delta variant that sent Israel back into mitigation is a growing presence in Illinois. We expect it to dominate our cases statewide by the fall. The lessons here at home and across the world are a harbinger of what could happen here, particularly in low vaccinated areas. And the health department says they are still working to determine if any of these cases were caused by a specific strain. Hmm. All right, Priscilla Thompson, thank you. And it's always great to have you here on set with us. Good to be here. Yeah, thank you for all our COVID headlines. We'll see you soon. All right, the historic heat wave that scorched the West is winding down. Now the East Coast is feeling the heat and on top of that is also facing a tropical storm system. NBC meteorologist Dylan Dreyer joins us from Bryant Park here in New York City with more. Hi, Dylan. Good morning. 
Hey, good morning, guys. You know, the heat wave that started yesterday is expected to bring us the hottest temperatures we've seen so far this year. In the Northeast, we have heat advisories and heat warnings in effect, and they stretch down the coast. And so often we say it's not just the heat, it's the humidity. And the humidity is going to make cities like Boston, New York, Philadelphia feel like it's well above 100 degrees. And the worst is yet to come. This morning, across the Northeast, a scorching summer heat wave, dangerous temperatures and extreme humidity sizzling cities up and down the coast. I'm surprised that it's this hot this early. Northeast temperatures soaring past seasonal averages with heat advisories stretching from New Jersey to Maine. I try to drink a lot of water. Philadelphia and Boston declaring heat emergencies, preparing for possible record-breaking temperatures. The heavy, humid air in many places feeling hotter than 100 degrees. It's hot. (laughs) The humidity. It's horrible. People and pets cooling off however they can. New York opening city pools despite a lifeguard shortage coming out of the pandemic. Beaches along the coast already packed ahead of the 4th of July holiday. They had summer soccer camp this morning and I figured a good way to cool off was to come to the beach. Off South Carolina's shores, Tropical Storm Danny strengthened before drenching the coast. It's already the fourth named storm of the year, months earlier than normal. Now, I know it's summer and it's supposed to be hot, but uh, one friendly reminder here is that the heat really needs to be taken seriously because heat is actually the number one cause of weather-related deaths in this country. I'm always carrying around this big jug of water, and this is exactly what you're going to need today. You stay hydrated if you have to spend a lot of time outdoors, and better yet, stay indoors as much as you can today. Joe and Savannah. Dylan, I have that same water bottle, and I love the little encouragements. That is a great tip. (laughs) Thank you so much. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> all right, let's see what's going on with the weather moving forward and get a check on your morning news now weather all around the country. Yeah. Hi, Bill. Good morning. Good boy. I think I was able to look closely at Dylan's bottle. I think halfway it says don't give up. Yeah, it does. Like, and it goes up, like, way to go. Of- <laughs> You're almost there. It's kind of fun. <laughs> Yes, head to the bathroom when you get to the top, yes. <laughs> All, right, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so yesterday was, as we had advertised, was just an unprecedented, unparalleled day of heat in the Northwest. And now that we're starting to add up all the totals, because yesterday was the peak of it, Look where Portland falls. So this is the list of all the major cities in the country and the hottest all-time temperatures that they've had. Phoenix, of course, on top of the list, as you'd expect. Uh, Vegas is second at 117. But Portland had 116 degrees yesterday. They're now third on the list. That's insane. And it's not like Seattle's not far back either. Seattle had an all-time record high of 108 yesterday. Seattle used to be like in the 30s or 40s. They've jumped so much higher on this this list now. They are higher than Baltimore, D.C., and New York. So, like, Seattle's now, like, considered like a hot city. So today, 12 million people impacted. We've taken Portland out of the excessive heat warning. Good for them. A little bit cooler today in the northwest on the coast, but not inland. And also 44 million people in the northeast. So today, about 103 in Burns, uh, Oregon, 110 in Spokane. But notice Seattle, you're back at, into the 90s. That's a typical hot day, at least for you. Reading 108. And as we head to the northeast, this is where it's going to be just like yesterday, mid-90s on the coastal areas. It'll feel like about 100 to 110, a little bit cooler in the Great Lakes. Tomorrow's the last day of the heat wave in the Northeast. It'll still feel like 100 when you factor in the humidity. But as we go through Wednesday night, the relief will come in the form of some dangerous thunderstorms. We're going to be under a slight risk of severe thunderstorms, gusty winds, maybe even an isolated tornado or two. So everything comes, you know, slowly we're going to round back into what we consider normal, Mm. if there is a normal anymore. Um, But, yeah, it's going to take a day or two to get there. Yeah, and then it's July and August, so probably much more around the corner. Yeah. Lots that we'll be hearing from you. Thank you so much, Bill. U.S. forces in Syria came under rocket fire on Monday, just one day after American fighter jets carried out airstrikes on Iran-backed militia groups in Iraq and Syria. A U.S. military spokesman said there were no injuries and later tweeted that U.S. troops responded by conducting counter-battery artillery fire. The Iraqi government is condemning the U.S. air raid, calling it a violation of the country's sovereignty, adding it would study legal options to stop it from happening again. 
NBC News correspondent Ali Arouzi joins us now from Tehran. So, Ali, a lot of countries involved here, Iraq, Syria, but you're there in Iran. What has been the reaction there in Iran to these U.S. strikes? Good morning, Joe. Well, we've only heard from the foreign ministry spokesperson so far who condemned the airstrike, saying the United States is taking the wrong path in the region and that Washington is continuing the failed legacy of the previous administration. He said uh, instead of creating tensions and problems in the region, the U.S. should leave the region and let people establish their own security without Washington interfering, which only causes disruptions. Other than that, officials here have been uncharacteristically silent about the airstrikes. Of course, the militias in Iraq and Syria vowed revenge. They made good on that threat, obviously. So, Ali, are there any signs that Iran-backed militia groups could step up attacks on U.S. interests in the region in the wake of these airstrikes? Well, there's been an alarming increase recently in the number of attacks by Iranian-backed militias on U.S. assets, attacks that have become more sophisticated, using more advanced hardware. And the reality is, Joe, that they will probably continue with varying degrees of severity depending on the, on the political climate, because ultimately their goal is to expel all U.S. troops from the region. Look, it was only last week that the Hashd al-Shabi militia had a military-style parade in Iraq showing off their hardware, including tanks and drones, which are probably supplied by Iran. Uh, they look more powerful than the Iraqi army. And you don't flex that kind of military power if you don't want to send a message to the U.S. Uh, that they're not welcome. Uh, by and large, the attacks have been contained, but the smallest miscalculation could have massive implications for both Iraq, Iran and the United States. And Ali, any idea at this point, could this latest escalation in tensions have any impact at all on nuclear talks with Iran? Uh, ultimately, I don't think this will have a major impact on talks with uh, on Iran's nuclear program. If Iran wanted to make a bigger deal out of this, uh, there would have been a much stronger threatening statement by a senior Revolutionary Guard commander vowing revenge. Uh, there wasn't one, which is an indication that they don't want talks to fall apart. Iran has been pushing the envelope with the Biden administration to figure out their boundaries, see how far they can go. And they were probably expecting a retaliatory attack, considering how many attacks there have been by Iranian-backed militias over the last couple of months. Clearly, the White House doesn't want to derail talks either. Jen Psaki said that even though Iran's behavior is extremely problematic, they're seeing an opportunity to move forward with negotiations. All right. Ali Arouzi reporting from Tehran. Ali, thanks so much. Coming up, the first post-COVID cruise from U.S. shores has made its first stop in southern Mexico. And that means our own Carrie Sanders will be back with us with an onboard update. That's up next. Today is day four of a major test for the cruise line industry. Celebrity Cruises' Celebrity Edge is the first ship to set sail from the U.S. with passengers since the pandemic began. The ship it's making is making its first stop in Costa Maya, Mexico, on the Yucatan Peninsula, giving us an idea of what cruise excursions could look like in a post-COVID world. NBC News correspondent Carrie Sanders is on the Celebrity Edge off the coast of Mexico this morning. Looks like maybe he's on the pool deck for us again. Carrie, good morning, so tell us, what have these past few days been like at sea? First, are you having fun? But also, does it feel like there are enough COVID precautions in place? Yeah, such good questions. You know, first of all, of course, I'm having fun. It's a very relaxing environment. And uh, <laughs> I guess, you know, I can reflect a little bit of what the passengers have been telling me. You know, for 15 months, not only the cruise industry was shut down, but, you know, the country was shut down. We've been dealing with that shutdown because of COVID. And if you've got your vaccines, you know how that kind of pressure lifted off your shoulders that you didn't even realize you had. Well, now there's folks here on vacation saying that this is the first time that they've really been on vacation where they can feel as if they are in a safe environment. You'll notice I'm not wearing a mask. Folks on board are not wearing masks. 99% of the people on board were given uh, the actual vaccines. So they showed their cards to get on board. They came on board. The ones that don't have the vaccines are the kids age 12 and under. And we've been at sea and all it has been is good weather and good times so far.
Savannah. And so, Carrie, of course, the ship looks amazing. I'm happy to hear that you're having a good time. But the whole point is that you're headed somewhere, in this case, Mexico. Now, you've kind of just explained that the ship created this essential bubble here, making sure that everybody had those vaccines, that type of thing. So when people get off the ship this morning, kind of break that bubble, what's it going to be like? Are cruise excursions the same as they were before? Is that allowed? It is the biggest question. Take a look right now. You can actually see land as we cut to the other camera. So we're almost actually in Costa Maya, which is going to be the first stop. And so if there's going to be an opening for coronavirus to come on the ship, it comes as passengers get off the ship. They put in some precautions. Uh, they'll have to wear masks when they're making their way over, wear masks when they're off on their shore excursion if they decide to take it and come back. If anybody is not vaccinated on the ship, and we talked about the kids that are not, they'll have to be tested when they come back on. And they'll only be going with tour operators who have been vetted and Mm. have a sort of bubble when they travel. Right. Now, Carrie, let's talk about another cruise line. The Disney Dream was supposed to set sail yesterday for its first test cruise, but then they Mm -hmm. reported some COVID cases. I know this is an issue that Celebrity Cruises, which is, of course, what you're on now, faced a while back, too. What does this mean for the industry as they try to set sail again? I mean, how realistic is this that this is really going to keep working? Yeah, you know, it's such a big question. And I think that the cruise line industry, certainly the Royal Caribbean CEO, recognizes that there are going to be cases of coronavirus on the ship. The Disney Dream was doing its simulated cruises, what the Mm -hmm. CDC calls it. That's where they don't have paying passengers like they have here. They have employees, volunteers, people who go on and see how it works. People tested positive. Or the Disney Cruise Line said that the test results would be interpreted by the CDC as positive test results, kind of like an artful language there, because (laughs) maybe they're disputing whether they were positive. But most importantly, what they recognize is that the situation is there will be coronavirus on ships going forward. Let's listen to what the uh, CEO from Royal Caribbean had to say about the consumer demand about getting on ships. There is a worldwide industry that has lost billions of dollars. Are you going to be able to ramp back up or will there always be fewer people on a ship, smaller capacity, and that thus less money coming into your industry? No, I think on the contrary. Well, what people is, what we're seeing is people are so anxious to get out. Um, we're seeing pricing that is as good or better than it was before. Um, people are beginning to realize just how good the, the experience is, how good the value is. And so I'm expecting once we sort of ramp back up, things will be as good or better than they were before. Always a salesman, I guess. But at the end of the day, (laughs) the industry is starting up. And what you see happening here right now is that real world test. The cruise is seven days long. We're in day three. And it happens today as people get on and off to see if they can indeed keep this bubble enclosed. All right, Carrie, I have a feeling that we'll check in with you a little bit more throughout your seven day journey. Enjoy that pool deck while you can. Good to see you. Stay safe. The House is set to vote this week on plans to create a committee that would look into the deadly Capitol insurrection. Speaker Nancy Pelosi introduced a bill that would establish a 13-member select committee to investigate the January 6th attack. The bill gives Pelosi the power to appoint eight members to the panel while allowing the Republican minority leader to, quote, consult on the other five members. Pelosi's move is drawing criticism from Republican Congressman John Katko, who worked on an earlier bipartisan deal to form an independent commission, a plan that was later blocked by Republicans. Take a listen. This is exactly what I was concerned about, that we didn't have a balanced committee, and this is what we're going to have now. It seems to be very politically charged. Benghazi got nowhere. Look how long we took with that. That was politically charged on our side. Uh, got nowhere. Here to talk about the new plans are NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli and Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Haig. So, Garrett, I want to start with you. We've heard Speaker Pelosi's plans. We've heard some opposition there. What are the chances that this gets any Republican support when it's voted on this week? Well, I think they're low. John Katko was one of the 35 Republicans who voted in favor of the commission a few months ago. In fact, he was the 
lead negotiator to create it. And the statement you heard from him there, I think, applies to a lot of those House Republicans who felt like a commission would be the way to take a potentially politically divisive issue out of the hands of politicians and put it in the hands of professional uh, law enforcement types who could investigate it. Now having a committee that will be chaired by a Democratic member of Congress will probably uh, be made up of, of either eight or seven Democratic members of Congress, depending on how Speaker Pelosi decides to fill those slots, just does not appeal to very many Republicans. I think the whip count I'm looking at now is probably somewhere between zero and maybe three to five uh, Republicans could conceivably be in play to vote for this committee, but I'm leaning more towards the zero side. Um, Mike, so how is the House White House reacting to the investigation? Are they involved in this at all, or are they keeping this process at an arm's length? Well, Joe, on so many issues, this White House works closely with and often defers to House Speaker Nancy Pelosi on the best strategy. That's clearly the case with this commission as well. Take a listen to the White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki yesterday on this. I think the president certainly supports the decision by uh, the speaker to uh, create the select committee or to launch, uh, get the process started to form the select committee. Uh, in terms of the timeline of the release of a final report, I think he would refer to her and her judgment on that front. Remember, earlier this month, the White House said the president wouldn't create his own commission. The White House saying that Congress has a unique role and ability to investigate this issue itself. Garrett, let's turn to infrastructure talks. On one side, progressive House members rallied in front of the White House, pushing for the president to add climate change action to this bipartisan deal. On the other side, he got Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, who has his own concerns about the deal without any climate change introduced into it. Just how fragile is this deal right now? Joe, this reminds me of one of those television specials in which a stuntman walks a tightrope over the Grand Canyon or something on, you know, Sunday night primetime TV. That's essentially what the White House is going to have to do to get both of these bills to the president's desk in roughly the same time frame with everybody they want on board. On one side of the Grand Canyon, you've got the uh, House progressives and Senate Democrats, by the way, who could choose to flex their muscles at any time, wanting a bigger a uh, bolder, more aggressive package on the reconciliation side. And on the other side, you've got Senate Republicans. You're probably going to need at least 10, if not more of them, to vote for the bipartisan deal. And over on that side, you've now got Mitch McConnell weighing in and saying he wants Democratic leaders to go even further in delinking those two bills. Here's what he told local reporters in Kentucky yesterday. And so what I did this morning is to call on the president to ask the majority leader and the speaker to, to deal with these issues separately, to deal with them separately. That's the way the deal was negotiated according to the 10 Republicans, I can assure you, who were in the discussion. There was no agreement that they would be linked. McConnell, of course, a former majority leader, knows that the Democratic leaders can't delink these things or off they pitch into the Grand Canyon. And so this is just going to be a very tenuous process for the weeks ahead, guys. All right. Garrett and Mike, thank you both so much. Appreciate it. The Supreme Court handed a major victory to transgender students after a six-year battle. This decision concerns a lawsuit brought on by Gavin Grimm, a transgender male who was a high school student at the time. The justices affirmed a lower court ruling that said a Virginia school violated Grimm's rights when they banned him from gender appropriate bathrooms. NBC News justice correspondent Pete Williams explains the case and what it means for the state of LGBTQ rights. This ends a legal battle that began when the school board in Gloucester County, Virginia, said that transgender students could not use the bathrooms matching their gender identity. That policy was challenged by a transgender high school student, Gavin Grimm. He was born female but identified as male after his freshman year in high school, legally changing his name and beginning hormone therapy. At first, the principal gave him permission to use the boys' bathroom, but then the school board adopted a policy saying restrooms were limited to, as the board put it, the corresponding biological genders. So Gavin Grimm sued. He said the policy stigmatized him and made him feel ashamed. And he won two rounds in the lower federal courts. They ruled that the board's policy violated Title IX. That's the federal law that prohibits discrimination based on sex in school programs. And now the Supreme Court has declined to take up the school board's appeal of those decisions. 
The court did not rule on who's right about this, so this sets no national precedent, but it does leave Gavin Grimm's victory in place. Two things have changed since he began this legal fight in the courts. First, the Supreme Court ruled last year that a separate federal civil rights law bans employment discrimination on the basis of gender identity. And second, the Biden administration has interpreted that ruling as applying to Title IX as well. This issue may be coming back to the Supreme Court, though. There are legal challenges now brewing over transgender athletes and which teams they can play on in school sports. Joe, Savannah? All right, Pete Williams, thank you so much. Time to take a look at what's making news around the world this morning. NBC News foreign correspondent Janice mackey Frayer joins us from Beijing. Hi, Janice. Hey, good morning, Savannah and Joe. If you are a vaccinated traveler and you have your eye on Europe this summer, there is some good news. Austria is now allowing certain U.S. visitors. You need to be vaccinated. You also need to present a negative COVID test. Austria is just the latest country to update its low risk country list. However, that U.S. UK travel corridor happening this summer, it probably won't. There are some delays in negotiations apparently related to the uptick in COVID cases in the UK related to the Delta variant as well as some questions around the AstraZeneca vaccine. So those meetings are going to stretch into August. Ethiopia's government declared an immediate unilateral ceasefire in its Tigray region uh, and coming nearly eight after eight months of conflict with Tigray fighters. Uh, government soldiers have apparently retreated. Uh, this is a region that desperately needs some relief. There are hundreds of thousands of people suffering the world's worst famine crisis. Uh, officials say that the ceasefire will remain remain in place until the end of the critical planting season that is in September. And in Australia, a native mouse that was believed to be extinct 150 years ago isn't. In fact, the Gould's mouse is thriving on islands off the western coast of Australia where it's called the Shark Bay mouse. It was only now that scientists compared the DNA of these two mice and realized that they were the same. Now, the Gould's mouse was very common on the mainland uh, back around the time of European colonization, but it began to disappear around 1840. It's a little bit smaller than a rat, super cute, apparently very social, likes to live in family groups and enjoys soft, dry grass and a nice, cozy burrow. <laughs> and that's a look at some of the headlines around the world. Don't we all just love a cozy burrow? So, sounds like a dating profile for the mouse you just read off there. Right. <laughs> well, apparently, if you're looking to hide out for 150 years, then a cozy burrow off the western coast of Australia is the place sounds to be. Sounds nice. We can all relate right now. All right. Janice, Cute, thank also you so much. debatable. Well, for mouse. <laughs> Janice, thanks. <laughs> A Yankees fan who dreamed of being a Batgirl 60 years ago finally got her wish. Gwen Goldman wrote to the Yankees back in 1961 at the age of 10, asking to be a Batgirl. She received a rejection letter telling her, quote, a young lady such as yourself would feel out of place in a dugout. When Goldman's daughter recently sent that letter to the Yankees, GM Brian Cashman invited the 70-year-old to be an honorary Batgirl. On top of that, last night, the retired preschool social worker threw out the ceremonial <laughs> first pitch at Yankee Stadium. She called the whole experience a thrill of a lifetime. And she's got the mask on there, but the smile on her face absolutely contagious so cool to see that happen 60 years later yeah i love that like stick it to the guy that wrote that first yeah, no letter kidding. now i'm yeah. giving the first if he, pitch if he sees this now <laughs> yeah it's be upset. so awesome right. <laughs> thanks joe <laughs> Popular e-cigarette company Juul Labs has agreed to a $40 million settlement with North Carolina after being accused of targeting children with their products. And actually, at least nine other states have pending cases against the company. NBC News correspondent Stephanie Gosk has more. E-cigarette giant Juul didn't just hook North Carolina kids on their products. It was part of their business strategy, according to a North Carolina lawsuit filed in 2019. NBC News spoke with Luca Kynert that year. I noticed I was like, this is getting out of control. 15 years old at the time, Luca had to go to rehab to get over his addiction to e-cigarettes. 
He went from being a straight A student to an F student. Jewel and the state announced a $40 million settlement. Today's court order will go a long way towards ensuring that their e-cigarette product is not in its hands. Juul, which had already stopped selling its fruity and sweet flavors in the U.S., is now agreeing to several new changes, including not using models under the age of 35 in its advertising. The company denies any wrongdoing, adding in a statement, this settlement is consistent with our ongoing effort to reset our company as we continue to combat underage usage. Juul argues their product is an important option for adults transitioning away from traditional cigarettes. But while a survey in 2020 found that underage use is down, roughly 20 percent of high schoolers still say they use e-cigarettes, and nearly a quarter of them say it's a daily habit. Access in North Carolina will be tougher now, and with 12 states and the District of Columbia filing similar lawsuits against Juul, more changes could be coming. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News. Coming up, Jamie Lynn Spears is now breaking her silence on her older sister Britney's conservatorship battle. Her emotional message as the Free Britney movement gains even more steam up next. Many Mississippi tenants have yet to receive COVID-19 rental assistance, despite the looming July 31st eviction moratorium deadline. $186 million was allotted to help renters pay past due rent and bills. So far, only 20 percent of applications for assistance have been approved. The delay in federal payments could lead to a surge in evictions by the end of the summer. NBC News national reporter Bracey Harris joins us now for more. Bracey, good morning. So first, let's just talk through what these renters are supposed to be receiving if they're approved, but also why the money is not reaching those renters. Yes, good morning. So the way that the programs work, there are three across the state of Mississippi, is that renters can apply for uh, back rent to help them cover costs that they may have accrued due to financial hardships because of the pandemic. Um, They can also get help with forward rent. And what my reporting has found is that between the three programs, there's a lot of difference in terms of active they are in the communities that they serve and getting the word out. And that's half of the battle. If the folks who need assistance don't know to apply for it, um, then they can't get that help. The other part is that there have been delays at the state level in putting some systems in place for um, vetting and reviewing the applications fully. So um, up until recently, the state did not have the capacity to review a, a high level of volume of applications quickly. So uh, that's resulted in a little bit, I think, of a a lag in in pushing the funds out. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I thought the article did a really good job at pointing out is the fact that this is also helping landlords, of course, because landlords are on the other end of this and also hurting. And if these renters are able to get that back rent, then it helps those landlords. You also took a closer look at how the lack of COVID-19 renters assistance is disproportionately affecting people of color. So walk us through what that looks like in Mississippi. Mississippi, especially because the state was already struggling with housing issues before COVID. Right. So we know from um, data that the census has been collecting throughout the pandemic that renters of color um, were more likely to say that they were falling behind on payments during this time. So in Mississippi, one of the programs that I looked at serving the state's most populous county called Hines County um, had only pushed out um, just over 3% of its rental assistance as of mid-June. And that is a, a a county that is predominantly African-American. So there are just some concerns about vulnerable tenants getting assistance quickly. And now tell me, are local organizations doing anything to make sure that renters are aware that they're entitled to relief to actually go apply for this? And why is the local government struggling to ensure proper outreach to these people who need it? Yeah, so I've spoken with advocates that have just started taking a hands-on approach, literally printing out applications, dropping them off at libraries, churches, uh, just trying to uh, get the word out more quickly and and make sure people know that these funds are available to assist them. All right. Bracey Harris, thank you so much for joining us with your reporting. All right. Thank you. Nearly a week after Britney Spears' shocking court testimony about her conservatorship, her younger sister, Jamie Lynn, is speaking publicly about the issue for the first time. 
NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin joins us now with more. Aaron, good morning. Good morning, Joe. That's right. Jamie Lynn is taking to social media to respond to critics who say she should have done more while making it clear she supports her sister no matter what. I'm not my family. I'm my own person. I'm speaking for myself. Jamie Lynn Spears, once always by her superstar sister's side, now reemerging in her defense in an emotional Instagram video. If ending the conservatorship, if flying to Mars or whatever the hell else she wants to do to be happy, I support that 100%. Jamie Lynn addressing her sister's conservatorship head on, saying she's completely behind what Brittany wants. I don't care if she wants to run away to rainforest and have a zillion babies in the middle of nowhere. I am only her sister who is only concerned about her happiness. In a dramatic hearing last week, Brittany begged a judge to end the court-ordered conservatorship, an arrangement that's given her father, Jamie Spears, and other conservators control of her affairs since 2008, following two involuntary psychiatric holds and a very public breakdown. Brittany calling the conservatorship abusive, alleging she was forced to perform, take medication, and attend therapy against her will, saying conservators won't let her get married or have more children, even preventing her from removing an IUD. Her father's attorney telling the court, Mr. Spears is sorry to see his daughter suffering and in so much pain. Brittany's account prompting an explosion of support for Spears and criticism of her family, including an online petition asking Netflix to remove Jamie Lynn from an upcoming project for her alleged role in the dehumanizing conservatorship of her sister, Brittany Spears. Jamie Lynn, who starred in the teen sitcom Zoe 101, firing back. But I can assure you that I've supported my sister long before there was a hashtag, and I'll support her long after. Fellow pop star Christina Aguilera also offering support to Britney, posting a photo of the Paris children. Aguilera writing, It is unacceptable that any woman or human wanting to be control of their own destiny might not be allowed to live life as they wish. My heart goes out to Britney. She deserves all the true love and support in the world. Brittany and her boyfriend spotted on vacation in Hawaii after the hearing. The singer using her own Instagram to apologize to fans for holding back in the past, writing, I apologize for pretending like I've been okay the past two years. I did it because of my pride and I was embarrassed to share what happened to me. And as emotional as Britney's testimony was in court, in order to end the conservatorship, her lawyer needs to file a motion. It's unclear why that hasn't happened yet. The next hearing is scheduled for July 14th. Joe. All right, Aaron, thanks so much. Time now for our CNBC Money Minute, the biggest financial headlines of the day and why they matter to you. CNBC's Rahel Solomon is with us this morning. Rahel, good morning. Hey, Joe and Savannah, good morning to you. So let's talk about Facebook first, joining the Trillion Dollar Club, the market value of the social media giant, topping that mark for the first time. It's now just the fifth member of the exclusive group, along with Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, and Google's parent company, Alphabet. And the move comes after a judge dismissed antitrust lawsuits brought by the Federal Trade Commission and a group of state attorneys general. The judge saying that they didn't provide enough evidence that Facebook is a monopoly and investors clearly like that news. Uh, Amazon is turning part of its headquarters in Seattle into a public cooling center. That's as the Pacific Northwest, of course, continues to deal with that record breaking heat wave. The site has room for up to 1000 people. Many homes in the area don't have air conditioning because Seattle's climate is usually much more mild during the summer months. And forget 20 minutes or less because Domino's is launching a new guarantee, two minute or less takeout. So you have to check in when you arrive and then a Domino's team member will bring out your order in less than two minutes or your next pizza is free. And there's more in partnership with DraftKings. Customers can now bet if the nationwide average wait for curbside pickup ends and so being less than two minutes, at least 80 percent of the time, a wager gives you a chance to win a share of two hundred thousand dollars. I just really hope that the folks that work at Domino's get comfortable shoes because that's going to be a yeah, lot of yeah. running back and forth. Seriously. Guys. Training for the Olympics yeah. at that rate. All right. <laughs> I got to say, I love Domino's. Oh, you do? OK. Yeah. Not a fan. Two minutes or less. Yeah. <laughs> My dad calls it kids pizza. He's oh. like, no, yeah. I think it's delicious. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Rahel, thanks so much. <laughs> Coming up, it's no secret rideshare prices are surging out of control. We'll tell you what's driving this post-COVID cost hike next.
It definitely feels like cars, rentals, used cars, ride shares are all costing more now than before the pandemic. NBC News Now correspondent Issa Gutierrez shows us how surge pricing is really surging as life returns to normal. For many people, getting back to normal life means taking ride shares to get to places again. For three days a week in the mornings, I take an Uber or Lyft to work. Yeah, we started taking Ubers again. But these last couple of months, customers have found that the cost and wait times for those rides are not what they were pre-pandemic. Oh, they're more expensive now. I feel like there's not as many available anymore. I think they're like totally understaffed and the prices have definitely gone up. I've seen it firsthand in New York City. Thank you. $26.24 to go about five and a half blocks right now. My Lyft app is telling me that it would cost me over $150 to get a ride to JFK Airport right now. Over $150. I have paid less than that for domestic flights before. An analysis by the research firm Rakuten Intelligence found that across the U.S., the cost of a ride was 40% higher in April than it was a year ago. In May, Uber's CEO acknowledged that surge level prices have increased and that the supply of drivers wasn't keeping up with the demand growth in the U.S. That same month, Lyft started to offer the wait and save option. I can save $30 if I'm willing to wait. It makes me think twice about whether or not I'm going to take an Uber or Lyft or you know, or the subway. I mean, it's faster just to walk sometimes and sit in the car or, you know, wait for them anyway. So I definitely am using it less. Customers are going to have to pay up or take alternatives. Diane Swank is the chief economic advisor for an accounting firm called Grant Thornton and analyzes the labor market. It is a bit of a chasing a moving target because at the moment, even as you're trying to bring more workers back online, you're still not fully into unleashing all that cooped up demand that we had from being sort of in our houses and not able to travel as much, not able to go out as much. Uber and Lyft have spent hundreds of millions of dollars on incentives for drivers to get back on the road this year. So what has this new rideshare reality been like for drivers over the last couple of months? I recruited two people at 800. Lyft has been doing streak hours. Um, it, it varies um, where if you do three rides within that hour, you'll get either an $18 bonus or $15 bonus. Some told us the higher demand for rides has been great for business. A lot of people went outside and business come up, you know, and I think almost every driver are happy. <laughs> But others say surge pricing is not as beneficial to the driver as one might think. Emmanuel Levy is a part-time Uber and Lyft driver based out of New Jersey. When everyone started getting sick, I stopped because my wife has a compromised immune system. He started driving again after he and his wife were fully vaccinated in late April. It's been a totally different field since when I stopped. However, with the increased rates that Uber and Lyft is charging, I'm not sure if we're really seeing them as drivers. In the past, um, the profile for Uber and Lyft was, uh, I believe they took 25% of the fare and then gave the drivers the rest. Now, they're just paying us based on time and distance and keeping the rest as a service fee, whatever that comes to. And those long pickup times often cut into drivers' earnings, too. Eddie Navarrete drove throughout the pandemic in California. He says he had to double his hours at one point in 2020 to make his daily cash goal. Over the last two months, he's finally been able to get back to working his pre-pandemic hours. I would have to drive 12 to 25 miles to go pick up someone and when, once I get there, uh, then I'll find out that it's only between 3 to $5 I'm only getting for that ride. In a statement, a spokesperson for Lyft said that they've, quote, added thousands of drivers in the past few weeks, and it's already leading to a better rider experience, with wait times down more than 15% nationwide and 35% in some major markets. Uber didn't follow up on our request for a statement. The money that Uber and Lyft pays me goes towards maintaining and replacing the car. I've gone through five cars in three years and I work for tips. I'd love to see both Uber and Lyft publish the rate cards for an area more prominently so that passengers can see what the drivers are making. All right, that was Issa Gutierrez reporting, and I know that we've both experienced that firsthand in New York, like she said she has. Yeah, I haven't tried Uber a whole lot, but when I have, it's been a long wait. I've it's noticed. the long wait, yeah, yeah, and sometimes it'll even say, like, we don't know if we can get you a car on Lyft, at least. It's It's been something. And cabs are, it's just 
there's not a huge supply for the it demand seem coming like back. There's yeah. as many as there were before. You know, yeah. That's a New York problem. But, yeah, yeah, yeah so. exactly. But, but we have yeah. the subway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, which has felt pretty safe. Yes. Yeah, yeah well. it's been great to have. <laughs> All right, that does it for this hour of morning news now. But the news continues right now. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.